So hello everyone and welcome um, to the Pavilion Stories Wartime Bexhill. Um, I hope it's a lovely sunny day in Bexhill as it is in Brighton where I am. Um, so this is the second event in our online series for members and patrons exploring the Pavilion's rich architecture and living heritage. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pippa and I am the Head of Fundraising at the Delaware Pavilion. And I'm joined here today by my colleague Matt, uh, uh, by my colleague Matt, who is our tech manager, and my colleague Dan. And together, Dan and I look after the Delaware Pavilion members and patrons. So on that note, I just want to thank all of our members and patrons for joining us today. And of course, for your ongoing support throughout our extended closure, um, it's really very much appreciated. And we're also joined by some members from Bexhill Museum. So a big welcome to you as well. Before we start the talk, I just have a bit of housekeeping. Um, I'll introduce our speaker, Julian, shortly. Um, Julian will speak for about 45 minutes, and this will be followed by a Q&A session chaired by Dan. If you do have any questions throughout the talk, you can use the Q&A box, the function on the bottom bar, to type your questions, um, which both the panelists and all of the audience will be able to see. So please do um, type your questions in there. We hope to finish the event by 5 p.m., after which we'll be hosting a post-event um, tea and cake Zoom for about 40 minutes for Delaware Pavilion members and patrons, where you can chat to Dan and myself and each other and say hello and talk all things DLWP. So please do join us. Um, you will have received the link to the tea and cake in an email this morning, but Matt will also post this in the Q&A box at the end of the talk, so you can go straight from the talk to the, to the tea and cake. And then finally, we'll be sending out a feedback survey after the event, and we would really love to hear your feedback, so please do um, check it out. Um, it's in a slightly different format to usual as it's a key part of our feedback for one of our funders, Arts Council England. Um, yeah, so please do have a look after the event. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Julian Porter. Julian is the district curator for Rothers Museum Service and he's attached to Bexhill Museum as its curator. As many of you know, Bexhill Museum and the Delaware Pavilion are long-term partners, and we're really delighted to be welcoming Julian back today. So, handing over to you, Julian. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, very, very kind of you to have me back. So, uh, really, this ties in with the last talk we had about the Delaware. We, that was a quick overview. Um, so, I'm going to get my slides working. That's it. I think we're rolling now. Um, this rather curious Daily Express cartoon of Bexhill in 1932, with our gouty colonels with their moustaches being horrified about anything new going on, which makes quite a lot of fun at our expense, but there's quite a lot of truth in this. Bexhill was a curious place it still is a quite a curious place but but the Bexhill we're going back to is not quite the Bexhill you may be expecting it operates on a much bigger scale than today so we've got the great and the good coming down and staying at Bexhill so here we are this is 19th and this is November 1933 and there's the 9th Earl Delaware at Cooden Beach with the Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald, who just popped down to see the Earl and to stay with him. So we are very well connected and we have as our champion the Ninth Earl Delaware, who knows and gets on with just about everybody. So the Ninth Earl Delaware, her brand, was Mayor of Bexhill from 1932 until 1935. And we can see here from the Bexhill Observer, of the 12th of November, 1932, the Knightville, Delaware, becoming mayor of Bexhill. And the mayoral hat is being passed over to him by the previous mayor, Alderman Mrs. Meads, who was the town's first lady mayor. Now, Mrs. Meads is also an honored guest at a very strange event in Bexhill on the 12th of October, 
1935, where she goes to an open day at a rather curious German school in the town. Well, German schools in the town are not that curious, but this is an odd one. This is the 15th of May, 1937, and the girls have gone up to London for the coronation and they've gone up to the German embassy. And I don't know if you can see the text there. Herr von Blomberg was very pleased to have such a hearty welcome and admired the students' pretty light blue blazers with a badge bearing the Union Jack in one corner and the swastika in the other. So this is Bexhill's famous Nazi girls school, Nazi finishing school, the Augusta Victoria College in Dorset Road. So very, very scary stuff. Interesting stuff. Interesting enough that Eddie Izzard has just made a film about it. So this comes out at, on Friday. So I hope you're all going to watch Six Minutes to Midnight when that is released at the end of this week. So very, very exciting stuff. So you can find out what was going on in Bexhill just before the Second World War. And it's the Second World War that I'm really going to be concentrating on this afternoon. So got some Nazis there. We've also got, unfortunately, some black shirts turning up here. This is the Bexhill Observer of the 25th of July. 1936. Happy ending because we beat them all up and chased them out of town. So this is Bexhill's Battle of Cable Street. The black shirts turn up, the, fact, the uh, British Union are fascists, but they're not at all welcome. And they're roughed up by Bexhill youth. And the Bexhill youth in question here, I can't tell for sure, but I have a strong suspicion this is the Bexhill Amateur Athletic Club, who are young lads you probably wouldn't want to have picked a fight with. But coming back to the idea of the connectedness, of Bex Hill and the great and the good coming down to stay. We find out on the um, 21st of March, 1936, that Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret come down and have a lovely day in Bex Hill on sea. So we get this idea that it's a, it's a bigger place than we think of today. We've got royalty coming down, we've got politicians, we've got the prime minister popping in and out. This is a very, very different Bex Hill. Also going on in 1935, we have a fascinating book published. Arthur Spray's The Mysterious Cobbler of Bex Hill is published. Now, Arthur Spray was a cobbler in Station Road with mysterious healing powers. So it's a remarkable book. I think we, we touched on this in the previous Delaware Pavilion exhibition, but it really is an interesting story. Uh, so this is all going on the same year that the pavilion is opened. And a very strange gentleman, the Yorkshire yogi, who was known to Arthur Spray, Dr. Alexander Cannon, traveled down to Bexhill in 1935 to see Arthur. And apparently the Yorkshire yogi was treating Edward VIII and had a great deal of influence over him. And there's a connection there to the abdication crisis. So there's all these really weird links going on in the town. But there's dear old Arthur. Don't look him in the eye because he'll, he'll hypnotize you. Coming back to more stable ground here, we have the brand new shiny Delaware Pavilion in 1935. This is quite a nice shot because it shows little emblems of three. We've got the three flagpoles, which I think you really need to put those back because that was an important part of the early pavilion. And this is the south side, south terrace. And if you've got keen eyes, you can probably just spot the pergola in the background and some of those mushroom shaped down lighters that we looked at last time. So May 1935, we're in the auditorium looking towards the stage. And we'll be talking about this bit of the building a little bit later on, seeing through the famous welded steel frame to the Hotel Metropole in the background. So remember this image, we'll be talking about that part of the building a little bit later on. And in the auditorium here, so this is the Jubilee event. So this is the 6th of May 1935, when the Jubilee plaque was laid and visitors having their first opportunity to have a look around the building site. All sorts of good stuff happening in 1935. We also start to get an electric train service. So there's the first electric train coming to Bexhill, pulling into the Collington Halt there, and also someone else popping down to Bexhill. We've got the Lord Mayor of London 
coming down to have a look at the Delaware Pavilion being built. So the Silver Jubilee of King George V was the 6th of May 1935, so the town is on fate. So we've got a lovely carnival float or jubilee coda float, I should say, going down Sackville Road with a, a triumphal arch being built across. And we've got King George V and Queen Mary popping into Bexhill to see Earl Delaware and Diana Delaware at the Cooden Beach Hotel, which was run by Diana Delaware. So they, they know everybody, the Delawares. So our champion, Knight Earl Delaware, Herbrand, born in 1900, dies in 1976, the town's first socialist mayor, socialist, theosophist, suffragist, pacifist Earl. Through the theosophy, there's also a weird connection back to Arthur Spray because that is based on the idea of spiritualism. Um, so some very strange things going on in the Earl's early life, a very different, very, very interesting, intelligent character. So here he is in 1931, born in 1900, so he's 31. And going back one generation, we have his lovely mother there, Countess Delaware, Muriel Brassi, daughter of my favorite person, Annie Lady Brassi, who traveled all around the world in the 1870s and 1880s. This is back at the Brassi homestead. This is Normanhurst Court in Catsfield. So in the background, we have 8th Earl Delaware, boo, what a cad and a bounder. This is just after the birth of Herbrand in 1900. And it goes without saying that by Christmas 1901, um, 8th Earl Delaware has run off with an actress and doesn't come home. And the young lady on the left, if you've read Francis Osborne's book, The Bolter, that is the Bolter there. And we see a little baby Herbrand on Muriel's knee. So we have troubles brewing in Germany, the Nazis are on the rise. So Eric Mendelssohn was Jewish and very wisely got out of Germany and brought with him a new style of architecture. So the Knightville was very pleased to welcome Eric Mendelssohn here with this new style of building to introduce that into Bexhill. And we get a little look at the Ninth Earl's philosophy here. This is a speech that he gave in Paris. This is the 4th of February, 19. 39 and the Knight Earl says we have formal treaty arrangements we have our common interests and these things bind us together indissolubly and he goes on to say we assert the right to think to speak what we feel the right to read the books and see the pictures and hear the music of artists not only of our own but of all races including Jews and finally the right to develop a uh, right of human beings to enjoy and develop the more decent things, their character. So a good chap. So he is a pacifist, but actually when it comes to the Nazi threat, at that time he's in government and he's one of the people actually pushing for war in 1939. So that again, this would have been a huge moral conflict for him, but he realized that this was an existential threat that the Nazis had to be resisted. So we have this new style of architecture and a new building technique with the welded steel frame. So if you didn't have your ticket to the Jubilee plaque laying, this is the view that you would have got from outside the fence from the building site. And here we are inside Herbrand doing his, doing his bit there, laying the Jubilee plaque. And here we have the opening event, the 12th of December, 1935. This is from the Bexhill Observer of the 14th of December. We have the Duke and Duchess of York, again, popping down to see the Earl, so have a look at the building site. And of course, we have Captain Jim Stevens, the fire chief there on the right. Lady Kitty, the Earl's daughter, wouldn't present the bouquet of flowers to the Duchess of York unless her friend Captain Stevens was there. So he was roped in, in order that the event would go to plan. And we talked last time briefly about the success of the Paul Robeson concert, the um, 22nd of March, 1936. And this was the cultural event that really established the Delaware Pavilion as a serious arts venue. This went down very well and was incredibly well attended. So everything is going very well in the late 30s. We have the Concours d'Elegance, 
of the 11th of July, 1936, when I suppose that the, if you can you have two unique selling points, I'm not sure about that. If you can have two unique selling points, Bexhill had the motor races and the Delaware Pavilion. So it all comes together there in this one off event. And we're having a look here of the pavilion from the air. This is it might be late 35, it's probably early 36. We're seeing the building only recently completed with the Metropole Hotel to the left and Marina Court to the right. So it's rather sort of hemmed in by two large buildings. And then of course, on the seafront, we have the colonnade, which survived. Originally, it was going to be swept away with a newly developed and um, a modernist seafront, but there wasn't money to do that. So the old Orientalist style 1911 colonnade survived. The marketing brand that we were using in the mid to late 30s was the Conqueror's Coast. And with the build up to war, I think it's a slightly unfortunate choice, but quite, quite, quite good fun. So I keep coming back to this. And as you can probably tell, this was for our French visitors to come over and enjoy the delights of Bex Hill, because of course, Bex Hill, it was originally designed by Eiffel Delaware to compete with the South of France. So we even want people from the South of France to give up on that and come over to Bex Hill instead, because it's very, very nice. And some other weird things going on. This is the 23rd of May, 1936, when you could have, and presumably from the roof of the Delaware Pavilion, you could have seen the Hindenburg and the Gref Zeppelin chugging along the, the, the channel. So this would have been a, a rather imposing sight from Bex Hill. I, I guess a little bit of a warning of times of change coming along. And here we are, this is 21st of November, 1936. So George Bernard Shaw coming down to the Delaware Pavilion to see one of his plays perform because he famously said he wouldn't give the pavilion his seal of approval until it was performing one of his plays every night. So the, the play was delivered. I don't think they did it necessarily every night. And Betts Hill people enjoying the Delaware Pavilion. So some lovely photographs left to us by Laurie Dre. She shows some informal shots inside the pavilion. So this is, I think, 37, and this is probably 38. Um, and so this is this is the, the foyer outside the main auditorium, and it, it strikes me as remarkably modern. This and very unchanged. This is this is almost as you would experience it these days. So everybody enjoying themselves, getting a drink, going in to see a show. This is the Morning Post of the 4th of January, 1937. The, the article is titled Bexhill's Solarium, so people enjoying the sun. Of course, this was built as the library. The library was a fairly short-lived affair. It was sort of in there to go along with this idea of health and happiness, so healthy body, healthy mind. You're supposed to enjoy the sea, enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the fresh air, but you're also supposed to read and improve your minds as well. So there's a few people reading newspapers, but the library concept didn't really take off. But still very, very busy. And this shot, again by Laurie Dre, shows the car park absolutely jammed full. I don't know how they got those cars in and out. Um, I was looking at this the other day and I'm seeing this, it looks like some sort of scuff marks on the wall of the Delaware. This is July 39. And I'm just wondering, is that the start of the ivy that we saw last time in the 60s and 70s? And if it is, that almost suggests that the ivy was planned from a quite an early date. So lots and lots going on, lots of activity. This is again, this is us. This is the Bexhill Museum Social at the Delaware Pavilion. So this is the 18th of uh, March, 1939. Um, I think that's possibly our old curator Henry Sargent in the background. They're in the correct position if he was going to be giving the talk there. So we're all in there taking part. And for those who enjoy a bit more keep fit, we have the Daily Mirror 8. And again, we looked at this last time. I think this is the 3rd of July, 1939. So this is just two months before the start of the Second World War. So everybody enjoying a bit of keep fit because somebody else is doing it for them. And there's Mr. Rhodes here, very happy at Easter 1939, because they're full, is a full house once more. So huge amount going on, very popular. And some nice adverts. So this is 1937, 
1938. And if you look very closely, you can see this is actually adverts for Bexhill and the Delaware Pavilion in the Indian press. And the one down at the bottom left is from the Times of Ceylon. So we really have to think of Be Imperial Bexhill. We're embedded within the British Empire, so there's a huge reach for the town. And bottom right, it's nice, a schoolroom of the South. So education, independent schools, very important parts of the town's economy. There would be a lot of international interest, not international visitors to Bexhill. So again, it, it's a very different Bexhill that we're looking back at now. I just wanted to come back to the Bexhill Amateur Athletic Club because in a sense, it's a sort of a parallel project. It's almost a sort of working class version of the Delaware Pavilion. During the Delaware Pavilion build, the Bexhill Amateur Athletic Club are fundraising for their new headquarters on the down, looking rather splendid there. That's 19 foot, July 1939. They've just managed to get it completed. And because it could be used for war purposes, it was allowed to be completed during wartime. Now, for the fundraising, we have the delightful Highwood Hillbillies, the band that they put together. This is the uh, 13th of February, 19. 37. They were introduced by a young Arthur Askey, and apparently they were much more popular. Well, according to them, they were much more popular than Arthur Askey. We'll have to take their word for that. Uh, but good fun. Um, I'm not quite so sure about this. This is the members of the Bexhill Amateur Athletic Club. This is the 10th of December 1938. Health and strength. I, I think they might have been hanging around with those Nazi girls a little bit too much. So we'll draw a veil over that one. This is a little bit more hot, wholesome. So we've got paddlers and sand castles on Bexhill Beach. This is the 9th of September 1939. So war has been declared. We're into wartime now. Interesting looking from the beach up to the Delaware. You might be able to see this pergola that I keep going on about in the background. Interesting thing here is it is a three-dimensional structure. So you can see how it would have supported a walkway along the top. And from the same uh, edition of the Bexhill Observer, we can see Delaware Pavilion staff and waitresses working with children on holiday to fill sandbags to protect the colonnade. So it's 100,000 sandbags being used there to protect the colonnade and to create an air raid shelter. And you might just be able to see the Delaware Pavilion and Metropole in the background there. So things beginning to get very serious. Uh, more of Laurie's wonderful photographs. He shouldn't really have been wandering around in wartime taking photographs, but I'm very glad that he did. So this is the 14th of September, 1939. You can see more of the, this extraordinary sandbag architecture for the colonnade. And that sort of beam that goes across, they used to be able to close off the colonnade and charge for concerts. And there was an outer walkway. The colonnade was much bigger than the structure that we know today. And in the Eastern Dome, there is the old observation post left over from the First World War, which was still very handy during World War II. Amazing air photograph here from the Daily Mail of the 14th of June, 1938. Um, eight. So again, you can see the Metropole Hotel. Also, that's um, Page's garage there. That's Morris House. We'll have a look at that a little bit later on as well. So this is just before the war. Um, so the Metropole Hotel, this was constructed, well, started be, to be constructed in 1897. It's complete by 1900. It's not demolished until 1954, but it, it, it's damaged very badly during the war and is a bomb site from the, from the war times onward. So it sort of sits there as a bit of a wreck on the seafront. This postcard, which I think is about 1938, intrigues me because, of course, you can see the Delaware Pavilion to the left, but they've modified the shops along the front, almost to try and blend them into the architecture of the Delaware Pavilion. So it's quite difficult to see the join there between the Metropole and the Delaware. So it's quite intriguing. It's used as a RAF billet. So the RAF are put in there. And on the 21st of May 1940, they set fire to it 
which is a bit of a problem. So this is just, this is during the Battle of France. So France hasn't quite fallen yet, but it doesn't last much longer. And you can still see some schoolboys in the town. So a huge event here. That's a view from Sackville Road. And this is a reprint from the Bexhill Observer from 1990, but showing uh, an original photograph of that fire. And then, of course, with the start of war, we suffered very heavy damage from the air raid. So this is actually a 1944 air raid, but it's the best picture of the Bexhill air raid that I've got. And the Metropole is bombed on the 30th of September 1940. Now, curiously, they didn't take any photographs. Or there are no photographs that I know of that show the damage to the Delaware, which was at least as bad as this and probably more extreme. So this is the east side of the Metropole, the side facing the auditorium and then the stage of the pavilion, which took the main brunt of the explosion. So coming back to one of Laurie Dre's wartime photographs, this is the Christmas of 1940. We looked at this at the last talk and we think the structure in front is this brick or concrete blast wall that was constructed to protect the auditorium so it was safe to use during the war. So that bit was protected. The 21st of September 1940 is when Hitler planned to pay us a visit. So this is Operation Sea Lion when the German army would have literally landed on our doorstep. So 1940, after the fall of France, we are the front line. We are in desperate trouble. But all is not lost because Spike Milligan was sent down to protect us. So the other year we did an exhibition about Spike Milligan on which we did this map based on the 1942 wartime map of Bexhill. I've indicated some of the places associated with Spike, which of course includes the Delaware Pavilion. I've updated it. I put a little black arrow with AVC on it, indicating the site of the Augusta Victoria College on Dorset Road. But of course, as soon as war was declared, the Nazi girls from the Augusta Victoria College left and went back to Germany. So a lot of what we know of Bexhill during the Second World War comes from Spike Milligan's 1971 book, Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall. And we talked about this rather cheeky quote last time. On Bexhill's seafront stood the Delaware Pavilion, named after Lord Delaware Pavilion, a fine modern building with absolutely no architectural merit at all. It was opened just in time to be bombed. The plane that dropped it was said to have been chartered by the Royal Institute of Architects, piloted by Sir Hugh Casson with John Betjeman as bomb aimer. And so a little bit cheeky, and as we talked about last time, Spike didn't like modern architecture, but actually loved the Delaware Pavilion. So that was an important distinction. Also goes on to talk about um, the invasion of England, although always imminent, did not stop the reopening of the Pavilion for dances by the local Rotary Club. Speaking of clubs, this is another extract from Adolf Hitler, my part in his downfall. This is Spike and his gang, known as the Goons, burning the clubs that they had at Millwood in Sidley. So we have the origins of the Goon Show. There's some connections back to Bexhill. And of course, they gave us the dreaded batter pudding hurler of Bexhill on sea. Spike held his D battery reunions in Bexhill at the Delaware Pavilion regularly. So we've got one of the later reunions here. This is 1979 with D battery. And this is one of the later ones. I think this is probably the last one. This is 15th of May, 1992. The D battery were getting fairly elderly at this point. So I think this was the last formal D battery reunion at the Delaware. And this is a picture we looked at last time, the Bexel Observer, 19th of April, 1941. And there's somebody in the background there on the trumpet. So this is the Rotary Club dance that Spike talks about. And there's a good chance that's actually Spike Milligan in the photograph at the back. So as Spike said, even though this had become the front line, German invasion could have occurred at any time. There were still civilian events taking place at the Delaware Pavilion. So the sort of theme of this story is that the Delaware Pavilion didn't close due to World War II. So this is the Auxiliary Fire Service having their dance 
at the Delaware Pavilion. So civilian events, although these tend to be a mix between local services and civil defense volunteers, and, and, and sometimes the army itself, and children as well. And we looked at the Scout Show. This is the um, 17th of October, um, 1942. I won't do any of my campfire jokes this time around. And Gracie Field's visit to Bex Hill. This is the 18th of September 1943. This is an ENSA show. So this would have been specifically for the services. This would be entertainment for the troops at the Delaware Pavilion. So this curious mix of civilian, mixed civilian civil defense and military use of the pavilion throughout the war. And this just goes on throughout. So we have the Army Boxing Finals here from the Bexville Observer, the 4th of March 1944, with an alto table just in there, just to add to the mix there. And Johann Schreiner, in his 1944 dilapidation and improvement report, actually shows how the auditorium could be permanently upgraded to make boxing a regular thing. And it was certainly very popular during wartime. Another quote here from Spike Milligan talking about um, boxing at the pavilion. The notice was pinned below the ticket office window in the foyer of the Delaware Pavilion. So it's one of Spike's cheeky stories. So the, um, the opposition, this is Lofty fighting Rifleman G. Motts. Lofty not very impressed, saying, I'm not fighting that until I hear it talk. And the use of the pavilion as emergency feeding center. So it becomes a British restaurant. So this was an off ration restaurant that you could go and have a reasonably priced meal. This is the auditorium and we looked at this last time. It's possible they are the south windows there, but it looks like the brickwork beyond. So we might be seeing the blast wall on the south side there. Um, 30th of August, 1941. And this is, look, by the light, it looks like it's outside. So it's the mayor visiting the WVS service at the British restaurant, 27th of September, 41. And I'm just rather intrigued by what that brickwork is behind. Is that repair work on the stage? It looks like daylight coming in. So I wonder whether we might be seeing the other side of the blast wall here. This isn't, this is the, this is the British restaurant, but it's not actually the pavilion, they, because they've, they've been taken out for a treat after the war. Um, it's 31st of March, 1945. They've gone to R. Scott's Cafe, but it tells the little story of how the British restaurant started in the Down School, it moved to the Edgerton Park Pavilion, and then in 41, it goes to the Delaware Pavilion. Lovely photograph here of the Ninth Earl Delaware in wartime. Um, it's a reprint from the Telegraph, 2nd of September, 1939. Now, Delaware was in charge uh, in the Ministry of Education, and one of his jobs was to organize the evacuation of London. So a very important role by the Earl during wartime. So at the start of the war, he's instrumental in getting war declared. And one of his other roles is to try and get all the children out of London during the early stage of the war when the South Coast wasn't threatened, but London was very vulnerable to air raids. So we see some very good, some very professional photographs of evacuees in Bexhill. So some London evacuees in Bexhill Museum with Henry Sargent looking at some of the taxidermy there. This is probably September 1939. The photographs are so good, I wonder whether they actually got some professional pressmen down to cover this. So it was probably all part of reporting how well the evacuation had gone. Um, and this is the 30th of September 1939. Again, it looks like another professional photograph. So they're making, I, I guess they want these photographs to go back to London so the parents sort of don't worry how the children getting on. And I think most of them were probably having a great time. We see Empire Day. This is the 31st of um, May 1941. So this idea, you know, this is when we were part of the Empire. So it's a very different world we're in. And some really interesting wartime stories recorded here by John Dowling. So this picks up on the, the, the story that the Delaware was used as a um, landmark 
by the Luftwaffe. And, and actually there's a story here that John tells. Years after the war, a Lufthansa airline pilot was to boast at a tourist reception at the pavilion. In the Luftwaffe, I'm not gonna do an accident. In the Luftwaffe, we would always check our bearing coming over the English coast by taking a sighting on this place. It was so new and white, it stood out clearly on a moonlit night. So some truth there that it was used for observation. Another version of the story is it wasn't, it wasn't bombed because it was a German building. And of course, that's not true because uh, it did get bombed. And this other story, which is, is really, really odd, lights blazed as blitz raged, is the story of a spy in the Delaware Pavilion that would turn all the lights on and open the curtains during the air raid. So it's a, it's a wonderful story. Um, I'm not going to try and sort of work out how, how true this, but clearly the story exists, so maybe there was something going on here. And this is the 13th of February 1943, Vexel Observer, and this is the town talk section. It's not really talking about the pavilion, but you can see there from the graphic that the Delaware Pavilion was used iconically as a sort of a banner head for this. So the pavilion is front and center there during the war. And more events being organized. This is 1943, again, so dances held at the Delaware, so stars in battle dress. And some lectures, this is again the 13th of February 1943. Two special lectures for the youth of Bexhill. They're going to love this one. Parliamentary procedure, that must have gone down a storm. Fighting France Speaks probably was a little bit more to their taste. And we came back to this map. This is the 1942 map of Bex Hill showing the um, civil defense facilities in the town. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit to look at the Delaware Pavilion, um, that little symbol there indicates emergency meals centers. The other two little brown spots further to the top are public air raid shelters. So the Delaware Pavilion as, as a, in emergency use during the war. And this was a map that was put together, I guess it's just after 1945, showing where the high explosive bombs landed on the town. So the town was extensively damaged during these air raids, and these are only showing high explosive bombs. There would have been thousands of much smaller incendiary bombs dropped on the town as well that are not recorded here, too many to record. And from late June 1944, we were also being hit by flying bombs, by doodle bombs doodle bugs and this is a, a map indicating where they were coming down so we really were in the thick of it other strange things going on this is a newspaper report from the Bexhill observer from the 13th of august 1987 and it recalls the story of winston churchill turning up in Bex Hill to have a top secret meeting, not so top secret because we found out about it, planning D-Day in the chapel of the Beehive School in Dorset Road. So again, all sorts of weird things going on in Bex Hill. But clearly it worked, we won. So we come out the other side. So this is Victory Holidays at Bex Hill, community dance at the Delaware Pavilion, 12th of May, 1945. A Christmas party. This was actually a Christmas play put on at the pavilion at the end of 1945. A party for Christmas. That was the Christmas play then. So things beginning to get better, coming out the other side. So this is a photograph that was used for a newspaper article, Women at War Workers. That's Mrs. Elphick and Mrs. Holder at the Page Brothers Morris House Shadow Factory. So that was just at the corner of the Sackville Road roundabout. So it was a top secret factory making aircraft parts, making parts for mosquito fighter bombers. And here are the staff sitting on the terrace of the Delaware Pavilion. This is the 26th of January 1946, telling the story of Bexhill's secret war factory. And they actually parked uh, the fuselage of a mosquito on the Sackville Road roundabout so everybody could go and see after the war when it was no longer top secret, all the, all the hard work and all the important work they had been doing there. 1st of June, 1946, this is a music festival at the Pavilion. So the children returning, singing school children outside the Pavilion. 
and some good music coming back to the pavilion. This is the 3rd of August, 1946. We have Florenzi with the accordion there with his Argentine Gaucho Orchestra. This is about the 8th of November, 1947 for School Road Safety Week. I, I guess probably in wartime, the children had sort of lost the skills of crossing the road safely because they're more worried about getting bombed. But um, this is inside the pavilion. It's intriguing that the bottom of the glazing seems to be boarded up. So I don't know whether that was to protect it or whether that had been damaged during the war. And Hugh Thorne here doing some puppetry to explain the dangers of not crossing the road safely. And so, of course, the puppet there has lost its leg. I think standing on that trestle table is a sort of health and safety nightmare in itself. So we'll move on from that. Going back to Johann Schreiner's 1944 war damage um, report with suggestions for improvement. So it's a beautiful document. So Schreiner had been an assistant to Mendelssohn and Chimeyev and did a lot of the detailed design work on the pavilion. So beautiful drawings in this. And this is showing the, the bit that's shaded in a sort of salmon color there, the parts of the pavilion that were damaged by that bomb in 1940. So very extensive damage to the west end of the building. So as well as the repairs, it also had this sort of idea to add a dance hall onto the east end of the Delaware Pavilion. And you'd actually, on the first floor, your ground floor, you'd actually drive under it. So it was a rather bold design. Of course, a dance hall would have been a very popular thing to add onto the pavilion at this time. But unfortunately, there wasn't any money to do this. Trying to suggestions for improvements to the main auditorium. And I love this one. This is his idea for a soda fountain in the pavilions. I think it's a beautiful design. But actually they just made very basic repairs to the building. So this is the 10th of April, 1948, repairing the building after the war, but not really using any of Shriner's uh, ideas there. They're just sort of essentially patching, patching up the building. So some lovely drawings from a guidebook. This is Winter in Bexhill, 1947. The guidebook had actually been prepared in 1939. So it actually was a pre-war publication that never got to be released. So it was re-released in 1947, but it shows the pavilion and the terrace, how, how it would have looked just before war in 1939. And that's a view from, I think it's actually from the roof there, isn't it? Looking across Pevensey Bay, to Eastbourne, so all that little stretch of coastline that the Germans were planning to invade, but we're safe now by 1947. And this is cutting, this is 25th of October, 1947. So it's a problem, they describe it as a problem play. This is Frieda at the Delaware Pavilion. And the interesting thing is an early role for Andrew Sachs at this production. So he would only have been 17. So another Jewish refugee. So some interesting things going on at the pavilion. And it actually, the observer points out special praise goes to Andrew Sachs, who portrayed the schoolboy, Tony Dawson, with remarkable insight into the moods and mannerisms of a growing youth who hopes there will be a war in which he can take part when he's old enough to enlist. So some really interesting people taking part in product, post war productions at the Delaware. And we looked at this lovely program last time. This is bubbling over 1947. The big summer shows are coming back. But of course, 1947, this is when the empire is coming to an end. So a, a big period of change for the world and for Bex Hill. But the big summer shows are back. Still a lot of interest in the town. In the summer of 1949, a film crew was down to film Double Confession. So this is the observer of the 13th of May 1950 when the film was released and lots of local people ended up as extras filming Double Confession. And a bit more filming, this time taking advantage of the bomb site of the Metropole Hotel. So this is the 19th of April 1952 and they are filming Potter of the Yard starring John Laurie, who of course is much better known for Private Fraser in Dad's Army. So this sort of association between Bexhill on Sea, Warmington on Sea, Dad's Army, that's a whole other subject, but very interesting. If you think about the geography, it would have been Dad's Army that was protecting our stretch of the coastline. I haven't got an exact date for this. It's about 1950. It's before the Metropole is completely 
demolished. But it's a remarkable view from the beach looking up towards the colonnade and Delaware with the huge bomb site of the Metropole looming up in the background there. So wartime Bexhill is something we're very interested in at the museum because again, working with Eddie, we have the 1940 war winter wartime model railway. And this is the central station in part of the railway layout. And another part of the series, Bexhill women war workers, we spotted here, this is Miss J Izzard helping out on Bexhill station. I think, yes, that is, I'll go back to a Delaware one. Oh no, I'll cancel that. I'll go back to a Delaware one and that's it. Right, everybody. Are you still there? How do I come out of this? Hello. There you go. Is that all right? Did you want that picture back up? If you would like to, yes. Okay, so let's, let's, we'll go thank you so that. much, Julian, for that. Um, so we've got a few questions that have come in during the talk. Um, however, if anybody would like to add more or has anything that they want to ask, please do fire away using the Q&A box at the bottom. So I'll go in kind of chronological order. Um, firstly, Nick has asked, going back to the pre-war period that you covered, um, Mick Feathers said, we're very lucky to have one of the first modernist buildings in Pex Hill, but was it the first in the UK? Um, first major example, I think there's small, like, small domestic examples of modernism, but it's the first major international modernist style building in the country. Yes, it was one of the first major kind of publicly commissioned and built buildings, but there were private buildings in similar styles going back to kind of the late 20s and into the 30s by architects such as Lebetkin and Behrens, um, who were already using the same style in the UK. Um, <coughs> following on from that, Nick also asked, were they planning to build a pier as part of the pavilion, which I know you covered in the previous talk somewhat. Mendelssohn has this mini pier and diving board on the 1934 model. So technically, yes, it, it, it is a pier, but not not um, it's not the usual form. That it, it's really more of a platform to get to, along to the diving board. Okay. Um, moving into the war itself, Christine Govier has asked, um, "What was the population of Bexhill during the war?" Oh and goodness. Do you know how many service personnel there were, either in the town or from the town, who were serving? Well, Kristen, you've caught me out there. No, I'm not entirely sure. The town is largely, largely depopulated. You had to be in a reserved occupation to stay in the town. I think the other problem is it's fairly fluid that people are coming and going. We end up with a larger population at the start of the war because we've got the London evacuees coming down to Bexhill. Following the fall of France, a lot of people get out and, and all the all the London kids go and all the Bexhill kids go and people in, in non-reserve occupations go as well but then uh, they start to drift back so and there's not really very good record keeping so we are partially depopulated but it is not exactly a ghost town but I don't have the exact numbers to, to hand I'm afraid so I apologize for that but there are lots and lots of soldiers down here and again that changes depending on which part of the war we're looking at and, and by 44 there are a lot of commandos billeted in the town and quite often that they're, they're put in people's houses as well so there's a lot of troops down here okay and then a couple of questions one from mick and another one from derek mitchell asking about eddie's film six minutes to midnight um were you involved with the research at all i did a little bit of research yes okay how did that come about and what what was your involvement? Oh, goodness. Um, 1999, Bexhill Voices 2 was published, and that has a section written by Molly Hickey. And there's a section in there in which she talks about the Augusta Victoria College, and that's really the, the main source of information. So when in 2004, I wrote this, there's a little bit in there mentioning what Molly had said and also repeating this local 
bit of legend in Bex Hill that just before the war started, lots of Nazi officers in, in full uniform were seen hanging around at the Cooden Beach Hotel. So I sort of put two and two together and thought, well, maybe this is to do with this Nazi school in the town. And from that history of the town that Eddie picked up the story, and this is about the time that we uh, reopened. So we, we had a chat about it and, 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 and there was a film. With, um, I actually had a question following up about the film as well, which is what happened to the college post-war. Um, well, it's very interesting. Um, almost straight away in the war, it's known as the Augusta Victoria Hospital. So it's used as a military hospital, I guess. Well, I guess military. It would have been used by townspeople who are injured in that area. And then by the latter part of the war, it's an army billet. So there would have been troops billeted in it. So it continues using, and the building is still there. So it, it survives. It survives throughout the war. Okay, um, and then back to the audience. Does anyone have any further questions for Julian? Um, Emily Leach, Julian. I'm sure you will probably know this. Has asked: Has a biography of the Old Delaware ever been written? Oh, there's a very good book by Alistair Fairley, who, do, who did the big uh, moral Delaware pavilion book. But Alistair's earlier book called Bucking the Trend is excellent. And as far as I know at the moment, that's the best book on the Nightfall Delaware. So it's Bucking the Trend by Alistair Fairley. OK, brilliant. Emily says thank you. Um, and then David has asked, um, he says another Nazi connection is Heinz Linger, who was Hitler's valet, staying yeah. in Bex Hill in 1945. During he the was here, he Hitler was here. Um, do you know anything further about that? Well, um, there's, the, uh, well, he, he's in the bunker with Hitler. It uh, doesn't end well. He's picked up by the Russians and, and then ends up in a gulag. And then in the 50s is released and does a sort of lecture tour um, in Britain and then ends up staying at the Devonshire Hotel in Bex Hill. So I, 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 it, it's bizarre, He's he, Hitler's butler is staying at the Devonshire um, and I just imagine just walking along the coastline thinking, oh, the Fuhrer would have loved this. So it, no, it's bizarre, it really is bizarre. Fantastic. So unless there's any other further questions, I'm just gonna thank Julian once again and pass back to Pippa to wrap up. Well, I mean, you took the words out of my mouth <laughs> and just to, just to thank uh, you and Julian for that great Q&A session and thank you to everybody who's asked questions. Um, Matt is going to be posting the link to the post event tea and cake in the Q&A shortly. So, and you all also have received it in an email this morning. Um, so if you do want to join us to have a chat after the event, on Zoom, please do come and join us. And again, thank you so much, Julian, for another really informative talk and for kind of digging out those gems from the, from the Bexhill Museum archive. We really appreciate having you. Um, so thank you very much.